So hello, thank hello, you very hello. much for coming in and doing this interview. I'm very excited. Thank you. Your father, Maleko Sho Ahar, Maleko Sho Ara Bahar, and I hope I was close enough. Yeah, okay. I'm very sorry, but he was he is the most famous poet in Iran of the 20th century. That's right. And even having this title, the Prince of Poets, was uh, something that had not been, been given since the 14th century? Uh, no, not the title. Mm -hmm. But many, many scholars believe that probably he was the greatest since 14th century. The greatest. To a country that poetry is really very important. Not only he is and the most important, but also they believe since, 14th since century. the 14th century. Yeah. And up to this day, there has not been another poet in Iran and Persian history, modern history, to surpass your father. No. And no one had that title at all, never given to anybody never else. Again. No. He was probably the last icon of the classical poetry. He was considered a neoclassicist. Yes. And, and what, what defines his poetry as neoclassicism? The style. The mm -hmm. style was neoclassical, but the subject matter was extremely modern and also going to continue to be living is the human condition and humanity and the beauty of our earth. I mean, anything that you can think of as being humanist, he was. Yes. And your father was very much involved in uh, the peace movement in Iran and in inequality in Iran. And as a result, he was subjected to exile, imprisonment. Your, your family was forced to, to live in poverty, destitution. Uh, and yet at the same time, he is so revered by the people of Iran. How is it possible for someone to have to be so respected by the people of his country that and yet he faced so much suppression, oppression uh, it, during his lifetime. Uh, because Iran never was a democracy. Mm -hmm. It was a dictatorship. And uh, if you don't never lived under dictatorship, maybe that question would never come. But when you live under dictatorship, to be loved by people and not loved by the authorities, two different things. Because they have the money and they have the gun and they have a control and their dictatorship, any kind of dictatorship. And my father was against dictatorship. My father was for democracy. He was a revolutionary man of human dignity and freedom. Everyone must have. But of course, the, 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 the dictators never liked his words because he was loved by people, but the people didn't have much, much choice, much uh, that turn against the government. When they did turn against the government finally, then it was Islamic Republic took place. But the, the dictatorship is very different than what the people love you or not love you. He was loved by people. He is still loved, and I think he is going to continue to be loved by the Iranian people, and also as we started introducing him to American in English language, probably they will see that his word is never going to be out of date. Right. Yes, and, and you in the book, you, you, uh, you make a mention of how it is for a poet to be feared by the government. Um, you said that in a country where poets are allowed to starve, where poets are thrown into jail and their families are persecuted, is a country where a government that fears the truth that poets write. That seems to really uh, play into what you were saying just yes. now. Uh, let me just put that up. In terms of in, of the, the, the dichotomy or the juxtaposition between power and people, and Absolutely. the power of the people. Absolutely. Dictatorship means that. It's the rule of one, or the rule, rule of a one class, 
that give feed in to the one person, one person and one ruler. So anything against that, against humanity or the freedom of people or freedom of women or freedom of press, means that you should shut your mouth. Okay, if you don't shut your mouth, there is a way to take care of it. They kill you, which they tried to kill my father, but they killed somebody else mm -hmm. that looked like him, the journalist, right? the journalist, and then they put him in jail to be quiet. But they really crushed probably his physical body, but never his soul. He never sold his soul to anyone. And he was defiant of dictatorship till the last breath. Right, and that's when he, he, he had tuberculosis. And even yes. at the very end, they had pointed him yes. the head of the peace movement. And he wrote the poem, yes. uh, the, in, the, owl, the, owl the Owl of War. Yes, and let's see, I just want to bring that up because I thought it was just, even as sick and frail as he was, he still yes. managed to write this poem. And you know, he says that he, 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 whatever was, whatever the owl had to offer in terms of, of, of whatever you could get out of war, he didn't want that. He didn't want that. It didn't matter to him. No, he, war, war, yeah, war it was, he condemned wars, and he condemned all the leaders who took their people into the war. It's extremely inhuman. And uh, he was very sick when he organized, I mean, the peace organization asked him to be, to accept it, to be the leader, and he accepted. And he became the leader of the peace movement. And although he, it was, you know, at the end of his life, but he still was his, his soul and his spirit was just as strong as he was 25 years old. His body was giving up, but not that. That was his principle, and he had no fear of talking about it. And you yourself described yourself as being against war and for equality as well. How, how? What was it like to be raised by someone with such strong convictions in terms of the equality of men and women, uh, peace, uh, fraternity, and so forth? What, what was it like for you to grow up in a household like that? Uh, is a mixture of both. Is a mixture of, you know, how, you f how do you like to live in poverty? How do you like to go to, to school and not to have a coat, overcoat during harsh winter? How do you go to school when other children are prohibited to talk to you because of your father? How you people at night, they come and throw a stone at your home? I was a little girl. Of course I was scared. I was shivering and I was very scared. And but, but we learn a lot in that household. We le learn how to be more a human. We learn how to fight in this world, not to accept dictatorship, not only dictatorship of the king or the ruler or anybody that not to accept anybody. We think for ourselves who we are, we went through very, very harsh life, very harsh childhood, and which we really didn't know whether we father going to come back from prison or not, or whether we will have enough money to have food the next day. But we move on, completely moved on and lived and did the best we could. And you eventually left Iran, you were in Switzerland for a time oh, when your father was ill and also part of your first marriage, which ended in divorce or an annulment, I suppose. And then you remarried afterwards uh, towards the end of your father's life and you moved to the United States with your husband who was a 
in one of the higher ups in the in the IMF in the IMF, the World Bank. World Bank mm -hmm. yes. And it was very interesting to read about what it was like for you to come to the United States, having grown up in, in a with these strong convictions of independence of you know for women. In fact, when you first uh, at the end of your first marriage, your father had said, written to your mother and said that you were free, that you had been free and to give you more freedoms, uh, you know, to let you have this independence. And yet when you came to the United States, you lost a lot of, yes. of that. Could, could you just sure. talk because about that? Because I, I married, first of all, a man who was much older than me. At the time that I married him and his generosity, I was actually, as I pointed out in my book, at very young age, I had so much responsibility, you know, because my two older sisters got married, left. My oldest brother was in the United States, and my younger brother was a political prisoner. And there, that was me. At the age of 19, I was the head of the family. My father very ill. My mother was taking care of, of him, and I had to just run the family. And I was exhausted, and I was tired, and I needed really somebody to help me. And my husband, second husband, was the best for me. He was very generous. He was very kind to me. He was good to my family. So I married him, although my father warned me that he's much older than you, and I don't know him, and he has been bachelor for so long. Are you ready to marry someone like that? Yes, I was, and I thought it was God-given gift to me that I could be a little, I would have had the help. And he did help me. And then when we came to United States, I lost all my freedom. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't have any friend. I didn't know anybody. And I had a little boy. And my husband had a very big job at the World Bank and, and Monetary Fund. He was representing 14 countries in, in the international board, you know, in the National Bank and IMF and also United Nations. My life was a very lonely life. And I think the worst time of my life, there was first few years in the United States. But I was determined to learn the language, no matter what. And when I learned the language, then I started studying and finishing my high school and then going to college. But all those came in very, very hard way. And actually, my husband, for a long time, didn't know that I was studying for my BA. He just thought I'm going learning English, which would make his life better because in the, all those parties, I can converse mm -hmm. with people. But every time I ask him permission to go to university, and he said, what do you want the university for? Well, at the end, you know, it was a couple of weeks before the commencement, I asked him again, can I go to university? And he said, no. And I said, well, this is the commencement. You are invited to come to the, my graduation. <laughs> of the BA. It was very, very hard. I worked. When he was here in, in Washington, most of the time he was traveling. When he was here, I really studied from 1 in the morning till 5, almost every night. I don't know how I did it. But I was determined to educate myself. That was the only way I could see to free myself. And I said that to all the girls and women. Education number one. What was, for you, what was that like to live with a man who was seemingly the complete opposite of your father? It wasn't very easy. But you stuck with him for over 20 years? I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else. Okay, there, there wasn't that many options in front of me. First of all, I didn't, I wasn't an American. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I didn't have money. Thirdly, where to go? And I had a little boy. I have to leave my little boy behind. So I didn't want that to happen to my son, to stay with the father who wouldn't get along well with the mother or the child. So I stayed because there was no other door open to me. I stayed and I got education. That's the only way I could have free myself and be independent. And I did that. 
and I did, and I never gave up. And it was very empowering for you because as, as I was reading it, as the more you educated yourself, the more independence that you gained through learning the language, you were really able to kind of turn the tables on, on your husband. That's what I did, yes. <laughs> and and I did, he just did it. You know, in one hand, I really think in one hand, he was proud of me. And in another hand, he didn't want to have an independent, educated wife. And this, I think it was the dual fighting inside him what to do with me mm -hmm. because he married a very young woman but she didn't stay young for right. too long she grew up yes. and grew up fast mm -hmm. and grew up that it was a wrong marriage mm -hmm. and grew up find out there is no other choice except education that's the only thing that could free me it was through education and that's the only way I could save my son. My daughter wasn't born yet. My son is to stay and take care of him because I brought him to this world. And I did. And I stayed and I educated myself. I finally left him, but that was a long time after that. Yeah. And I think that's interesting, you know, and, and, I, and I almost I'm not surprised that you found your liberation through education because uh, from what I can understand about reading about your father is that he played a big role in the education system in Iran. Yes. And so for you to also find yourself through the importance of education seemed like that was very much something that you inherited from I your did. father. Absolutely I did. You know, but, uh, I remember uh, last year or two years ago, University of Maryland, which have a... a a university for the language, Persian language and literature asked me to come over there and talk about my father, uh, talk. And I said, which language? This is for American mm. student, saying Persian. I said, do they understand it? Yes, they just graduate from four years. And I said, about what? About who you want me to talk? I said, about you. Mm. And then I went there and I said, it did not happen, these things. He planted all those seeds in me and in all the children. When you lived your whole childhood with someone like that, it is those seeds started growing and growing because I was very young when he was planting those seeds. But when I was in my 20s and I was in the United States and I was away from my family, friends, everything I had, it was behind me. Those seeds start going growing greener and greener than flowers. Then I came to this position then in life that my father always been with me, always through his word, through upbringing that I had with him. That was in me. It wasn't, and I know that was then the recognition that the only way to free myself and maybe able to free others is through education and nothing else. And I still believe that you have to educate women all over the world. Otherwise, we're never going to be complete. And in fact, you did a, a research through yes. when you worked at the library for the yes. IMF, and you did extensive yes. research on globally the education of women. About education of women in developing, in, uh, developing countries. And it was, took me two years to finish it. And it was annotated bibliography, but to give it, and then, I, I was working for World Bank and IMF, and uh, then the World Bank have it, you know, published, and we send it to Nairobi during the uh, United Nations the Women Day, and there it was grabbed by people. They loved it, and then later on, a publisher bought it from the IMF and World Bank and publish it and of course they remove my name from the back because I was working for them. And I always, that is always remain with me. If I were man, I don't think they dare to do that. Right. But I was a woman. And I was 
I was, I saw really discrimination in this country against myself a lot. That's why I always fought for women everywhere, not only here or anywhere. And now I am doing another research, which I have almost finished my research on, on the status of women around the world to see how much they improve or how much they went down. Right. Hopefully it's going to be next book. <laughs> I hope that there's some uh, positive in there somewhere in, in terms of the way things are going for women in education yes. today. Yes. And it's just touching on on your own discrimination as a as a woman in the United States. In fact, you said that you had applied at the Library of Congress and were offered a position yes. and you were offered a, a specific level mm -hmm. that everyone was going to go in and when you went to sign your papers they had knocked you down two levels and you felt that that was because yes, you are a woman. Yes, I, the first discrimination I, I felt really the, the quota. They had law school had right. a quota. You know, you want to go to architecture or you want to go to medicine or science. Everywhere there was a quota for women. But then there are three, we had three options open to women. One nursing, teaching and librarianship. And I chose librarianship. And librarianship, 90% they were women, but 90% of administration were in the hand of men. And the men hired me with two young men who graduated that year from Catholic University, and they promised three of us grade nine. But when I, I, I told them I signed my contract a month later because I wanted to go to see my mother in Iran. When I came back, I went and it was seven. And I was arguing, why do you give seven? You promised nine. And these two young men, they only know English. And I know French, and I know Persian. And you don't have any Persian cataloger for years. And still, they didn't give me what they promised me, so I turned the, the, the contract. And I left it there, and I went and I got another job which would have paid me less than grade seven. But I didn't sell my soul. Right. And you said that part of that was your stubbornness that you had inherited from your mother. Don't sell yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Respect yourself. You respect, you yourself respect yourself. Respect yourself. You may lose financially, but the time that you sell your soul, you sell everything. Yes. And so you, you, education has been a very big deal for you and the equality of women in, and in being in the United States, while you were educating yourself, while you were, you know, discovering that women had some level of discrimination in the workforce, uh, you also discovered discrimination against people of color in the United States. Yes. What, what was that like when you first really realized that you were living in a country that promoted the belief in, in equality and, and democracy, and then you realized that there were two countries? That was the biggest shock of my life. I really, everything I have read as a young woman in Iran, it was through the, through newspaper, through books that have been translated and so on. I never knew, really. I was very, very naive, and I had no idea how the black had been treated in this country, till we make a, a, a trip to Florida with my little boy, and my husband, and my little boy had darker skin than me, and of course sitting in the sun day in and day out, it was really, he really looks black. And I was sitting at the pool in a very fashionable, uh, you know, hotel, and my son was swimming. He was just maybe three years old, three and a half, something like that. And I just heard that the, 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 the hotelier, you know, the manager coming, oh, take the nigger out of water. And I was looking and 
See, they're, at, they're looking at my son. There wasn't anybody else in the pool on the children's side. And I got very angry. And then later on, we went to see the city by the bus. Then I realized the white have to sit on the front, the black on the back. And I couldn't take it. I simply couldn't take it. I finally, you know, I convinced my husband I'm going to get off the, play, the, the, the bus. This is actually inhumanity that I can see. This is not what I knew of the United States. I always thought this is the country of freedom, not the country of slavery, and still doing that. Mm -hmm. Then I started to read more and more and got into more involved. Then I joined the civil rights movement, not only women's movement, civil rights movement, but all of them are human rights. Exactly. It doesn't matter whether you are a man or a woman or a black or white or red. What difference does it make? To who told you you are better than me? What right do you have I put you down because of your gender, of your color, of one that this thing? I didn't e educate myself, but this I had it before even education. And that I learned it from my father. Not by talking, by doing it, by living it. And, and really quick, going back to your father, where did he develop these ideas? Was it something that he was taught by his parents, or was it something that was just inherently built into him? First of all, he was born in a very scholarly family. His father was also Malik Shuara Saburi, mm -hmm. because Bahar, as I told you, that was his pseudonym yeah. name. Mm -hmm. And then also in my family, when you go on, great-grandfather also again was Malik. So the, the poetry mm -hmm. and literature was in the family. And he has learned how to read and write as a very young age by the aunt. Yeah. So apparently my grandmother, who came from Georgia, they were Christian, oh. came to Iran and they accepted Islam later, married my, father, my grandfather. And she was a very educated woman. And one of the stories say that my grandfather brought up, you know, the, the Alexander Dumas translation into Persian, read to the children out loud. There were three boys, one girl. And when he, he was tired, my grandmother continued. So they both were very educated, and they wanted the children to be very educated. But my father had something more than that. There was the talent that he was born to be a poet. Yes, and he wrote poetry yes. about everything, including... He was a genius, really. In, yes, including, including your dog, Reba. That's he, right. That's, we love that dog. And after that tragedy, I never wanted to have a dog, except that once I came home, and my daughter and my husband, they bought a little poodle. Oh. <laughs> and the little poodle loved me more than anybody else in the family. And uh, uh, the, the dog was just another child, right. you know, and we loved very much. And really huge mourning when he died. She died, I mean, oh yeah. It was, there was a unexpected, yeah. yes. Yeah. Your father also wrote a lot about nature in his poems. Yes. And what was always, what was a striking description for me was when I read that you, you had many flower pots in the house, but they were all empty because your father refused would not allow anyone to cut any of the flowers no, in the garden. No, he wanted all the flowers are were beautiful when you look at them, appreciate them, let them have their own lives. And for nature, he had great respect for nature. And climbing the tree, which we were doing it all the time behind his back, mm -hmm. it was not approved by him. And so he, yes, he had a great love for nature absolute love for nature. And therefore, you know, we had that the garden that we call it paradise. It was a paradise. Mm -hmm. It was really nature and touch, or if touched by him, we had magnificent rose 
roses all around us and many other plant and flowers. Fruits. And the way that you, you've written about your father is so in such a very positive light and in reading the letters that he wrote to your mother uh, before they had even met yeah. were I, what I wrote was as I read it, I wrote that Bahar's letters to his wife to me are perfect. His goodness and moral sense of equality and respect flood through. It is overwhelming. I was really overwhelmed yes. by everything that he had written to your mother. It's just, he seemed perfect. I mean, mm -hmm. there must have been something <laughs> that he, I mean, and aside from his inability to handle finances, he just mm -hmm. seemed like, a very perfect person in, in his understanding of the world. Oh, he 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 was. As I said, you no, know, he was born with certain extra things that that probably the other in the family didn't have. He had and wanted really respect for women. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, he has utmost respect for his mother and his sister and for his daughters and also for my mother. And also he wanted to have an educated wife. Yes. And that was one of the conditions. Right. And also he wrote about there is no democracy because women in the Chador could see the man, but the man can't see the woman. And that's not good. That's not fair that the woman can see you and you can't see that. You only have to go what they tell you about the physical beauty or ugliness or whatever of, the, of the, your future. But he chose it because he probably trusts the family. If the family was very important to him, which family you come from, what kind of education do you have, these are very important. And when his, when finally they, they you know, they had the Iranian, they, you, you marry the guy, but be between the marriage and real wedding is always several months in between, you very rarely used to see each other. And therefore, through the letters, they express their feeling toward each other. But through his letters, you can see this is a learned man. Mm -hmm. This is an open man, is not a macho is not that I am so arrogant because now you, I own you. Mm -hmm. No, you don't own anybody. We're all free. And he talked to his wife and said, why are you talking about victimhood? Right. Why are you victim? I don't want to have a wife as a victim. I want a wife who be a strong and a stand up, a partner to my life. You can see that 100 years ago. And where? In Iran, you see that he was two, three hundreds ahead of his time. Right. Therefore, this is the father I grew up in that household. I don't think, you know, that everything that I have done, yes, he planted in me. But I didn't ignore the plant. You can have a plant and not water it and they will die. Right. But I watered the plant. I allow it to grow, and I follow the growth of the plant to reach the flowering point. And talking about uh, your father's ideas of, uh, of equality of women, and, and you mentioned the chador, and with the Islamic Republic, the revolution, with the Ayatollah Khomeini coming into power, was originally it sounded like while there, it was coming in as a theocratic uh, government or way of leading, it didn't seem like people anticipated the strictness uh, of the enforcement of, of the law, uh, the women having to wear the chador, the entire covering of their body, and everybody wearing black as you described when you came back for the first time. After that, did people, anticipate that it would be that extreme from what it had been? I don't think so. I don't think so. But you know, <clears throat> there are things that when you, as a leader in a country, don't allow the political parties develop, the people 
to only learn to live under dictatorship that's been told and they follow that. Therefore, when the Shah fought, the revolution came and it was really true revolution. But there was no leadership, there was no parties, there was no political structure. You know, Turkey and Iran, the same time, they have Ataturk and I had Reza Shah, the father of the last Shah. But Ataturk in Turkey never married, lived alone in one room of one of the palaces of Ottoman Empire and allow Turkish people to learn to have political parties, debate each other, no dictatorship. That in Iran has not been developed. It was ruler of one man and one man alone. So when the revolution come, when there is no political parties and there is no leadership, the only one that they went under, they were religious leadership because they have a structure. They have their own bishop, the cardinal, and going up and up and up till Ayatollah. So they took over because they had the structure and there was nothing else. And fortunately, a country was very ready for, for democracy, but because of the lack of the party, political parties, that the people went under the Ayatollah. No, they didn't know. Of course they didn't know. And then fast forwarding into 2009, and, and you, you wrote that every time that you return back to yes, Iran, right. you notice that things seem to relax a bit. Women were even wearing makeup. They were wearing less covering. And then coming into 2009, you're talking about there was no political parties, oh, indeed, yeah. but but coming into 2009, there were several opposition parties, yes. including uh, the one led by Musavi mm -hmm. and the, the Green Revolution. Yeah. Did the Green Revolution fail because people have n never had a, a true taste of democracy in Iran? What? No, I think I think this is my own personal view. You know. Mm -hmm could be variety of personal view. But my personal view and experience, I think two things. One, they kill you. Right. Okay, they isn't going to try you first while you are screaming in the street. They kill you right there, And but this is what I did, they did. Secondly, there, there is not really an absolute leadership, you know. The people uprising, uprising doesn't mean that much because they can kill you, and they did. They killed lots of people, they imprisoned lots of people, women and men and young boys, young girls, everybody. And they have no mercy upon you because if you are against them, you are with me or You're against me. Or against me. There's nothing, new. so they kill people because they have army in their hand. And they have besieged, besieged, or they are developed right. to be like that. Mm -hmm. And so nobody, after killing everybody, you know, the, the rest of the people, they know this is their future. So they stay away and has been crushed. But ab about the 1952 uprising, mm -hmm. I was in Iran. I was a very young woman, but I was in Iran. And I saw how American helped. Right. To crush the real democracy of Mossadegh and brought the Shah back. And then also even in 2009. I mean, this is everywhere. I am not telling no. you a secret okay, because the CIA put it out many years ago. Oh, yes. Then they're involved in so the this is a country country. which is very important. And the people with a thousand and thousand years of, of history and are educated, all of that, but always crushed by people outside power or not having really democracy inside right by bad rulers starting with the british empire the russian empire yeah. and then the united the yeah. states imperial yeah. power as yeah. well involved and yeah. even today involved yeah. in iran yeah. and and even as we've seen uh since uh, george w bush's administration the call for for stronger sanctions on iran's the the, the propaganda that Iran has these weapons, whether they do or not. And Iran 
seems to be politically at the center as an asset to people in power yes. to control because yes. of its resources. And not only resources, it is the, it is the whole way to the east right. and west, right. you know. And therefore, yes, it has been, unfortunately. I mean, these are the truth. Then the, the, the political power around, you know, in the world control it too. Because it's a rich country, yes, it is resources, rich. It's a huge country. And going back to the Green Revolution, and the only reason why I, I want to come back to it is because for people of, of my generation, the Green Revolution was the first time that we had really seen young people coming together in, 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 in mass, you know, in protest. Yes. Uh, for 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 equality for justice yeah. Yeah. and and I was I personally I was very uh, affected by it I had one green shirt and I, I it was a button shirt and I actually cut it so that I could wear as a wristband in, in solidarity and I wore that for a very long time and I I worked on the on the internet trying to help people get through censorship so for me uh, that what happened in Iran uh, was affected me greatly in, in, in shaping my outlook yes, on the sure. world. And I'm, I'm wondering, how did your father's uh, poetry, did, did, did people chant it at that time as well? Well, the, actually my father's poetry is just indicated how awful it is dictatorship, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why they are singing. The people in the street singing Morga Sahar. You know, and then also another thing that they did, they went because most of his poetries are democracy and revolutionary. Freedom. Freedom is number one, number last, number everything. So they pick up many, many verses from many, many poems that he had, put them together, put the, made the music, and nobody knows who did it. And, but everybody have it. Mm -hmm. And that is why he is so relevant today. Because he is talking to people again, rise again against oppression. And the people did. But they killed them. Right. You are confronted with killing. Look at Syria right now. Yes. You, know, the, you know, we Americans here really don't have any idea. I mean, I am American citizen. My yes. children are American. Don't have any realization what is going on in those countries. You know, they go on with the King Saud, they go on whoever give them whatever they give them. We have no idea. And then the, the press and the newspaper writing and talking something that is not true. Yes, right. And make you that the Iranian are looking like a monster. Right. But who is helping the monster? It's the government, the United States. Or British. Or, or British European. Or any European. You know, is it is this is something that that maybe people don't know or they don't want to know because it's very painful to see that. Right, just as your realization of the, the how African Americans were treated, Absolutely. it's it's very yeah. it it shatters the you know what you were taught as you know as a child the, yeah. the belief that Absolutely, that you know I I had for instance when the war was going on between Iran and Iraq, everybody was helping Saddam Hussein right. against Iran. Yeah. Okay, I had a friend oh, yeah. from fin, from. Finland, or Finland, no, from Denmark, mm -hmm. who told me many Iranians who fled because they are socialist country. So they were lower class of Iran, you know, the people who didn't take bath every day or they didn't have shower to take shower. Mm -hmm. They went to, fin uh, to Denmark, and this guy was telling me, oh, Persians are dirty. It was the next day Washington Post had a big article on the top, face page, front page. 
that Denmark is selling arms to Iran and to Saddam Hussein at the same time. I cut it and send it right away with the messenger, because he was at the World Bank, I was in IMF, mm -hmm. send it to him and wrote down which one is dirtier. Mm -hmm. Taking shower every day or what you're doing? He called and apologized. This is the mentality of the West toward Iran. They don't know what is going on. No. They don't know. And if you wanted to tell them they don't want to listen to you, this is my book. It's dedicated to many causes. This really the help and, and, and lots of lots of interview that have been done by my co-author. Finally, I open up. And this is what it is that you have. It's as painful as it is, and as old as I am, I'm not going to stop. That's wonderful, and and to say and quickly, uh, your father quote uh, had a very interesting quote in life: "Always take the road of truth, even though you may lose. Always take the side of the oppressed. This is the purpose of life, and that is certainly what seems to summarize your book, your Excuse. memoir. Excuse, Ex exactly what it is, yes. and exactly what my life was about. And and to bring you in now. How did how did the two of you meet? You, we spoke earlier, and you said that you've known each other for decades. And yes, we we were both at the International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. and I was married to an Iranian who was at the International Monetary Fund too, and I think at that stage there were maybe five, six, seven Iranians. So of course he immediately met Pavone, mm -hmm. and immediately he said, "You must meet her because you two will love each other." And we met and we loved each other. <laughs> and that was in the 70s. So she's been around through my children's birth and my, you know. My husband unfortunately died very young, 59. And we were both devastated. And we decided to try and use that huge emotion that we had for a creative purpose. Pavane's book um, that she'd written in Persian, a memoir, had come out in Iran just before this. And we decided to put our energies into creating an English language version of it. And as we went through, we got more and more ambitious. So we started off, Pavane would translate maybe at the time five, six pages. I would write it as she was saying it, just reading it, translating rough, and write it up. And then I know a lot about Iran and have been there. And I did a lot of research, so I filled it out a lot. And then I'd come back and say, this is what I have. And I would interview her many times and build it and build it and build it. A lot of the, um, the customs and the ceremonies and the history were not in her original memoir because it was assumed right. that all the readers would already know that. So that was what I added, the history, and then we just kept building it up. And then it became apparent to me that Pavane, being a Persian woman, was holding back a lot about herself. And we made the decision that that wasn't going to happen anymore. And in fact, she really was very, very open in many parts of the book. Then we got even more ambitious and we decided that our mission, in fact, was not just this. It was to bring her father's powerful poetry to a new audience. Some people in Europe are already aware of it. There is a, a, an institute at the Sorbonne named after her father. Oh, wow. But here, I think there were probably two or three badly translated, not here actually, in England, um, badly translated poems, and we, we were horrified when we looked at them. So we began on one poem, two poems, ten poems, and then we had to make ourselves stop at about, what, 25? <laughs> Something like that. But uh, we built it up that way. That's how we built up the book. Yeah, and the poetry really brings out very much anything that couldn't be said in 
in just the prose, mm. you know, was said in the poetry. Well, we tried to weave it in. And the poetry, Persians, as Palvani said, this is their highest art form. So I was fear and trembling about putting it in English. And I really, it would take me a long time per poem. Again, Pavane would do a rough translation and we would discuss what it was, what was meant because the poetry in Persian, the classical and neoclassical, has many, many layers of meaning. Many layers, some of them ironic, some of them political, Apparently, a poem about nature is actually an attack on the authorities and right. so forth. Very hard to translate that and very hard to try and replicate the gorgeous, rolling, sonorous poetry, the sound of Persian poetry. And it's meant to be declaimed mm -hmm. rather than read. So very hard, but we worked very hard on that. And I really almost sort of meditated on it. I began to think I knew her father. <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> so, you know, in the end, I think people that we've spoken to, including scholars, have actually been very, very pleased with, with what we've produced. Was there anything surprising that, that you found working with Par Parvane on the memoir, tra on the translation, that you, anything that you didn't expect or... I didn't, realize, I didn't realize, even though I've, I'd known her for many decades, I didn't realize until we worked on it, and especially when we got through many iterations, that I was interviewing her and really memories were coming back that she hadn't put in her original book or even thought about for years. I didn't realize how very hard it was for the family. I couldn't imagine that a nation could treat someone so great so badly um, because it was threatening. And, and not just him, but his family as well. To live through the kind of ostracism that characterized her childhood is just so hard for us to imagine who haven't been in a totalitarian state like that. It's, it was just dreadful. but. I think the fact that she persevered through that and then became a strong person and a very good person. I always knew she was a very good person, but I didn't realize how strong she was. And so as we were talking about the poetry and, and being able to hear the original, would it be possible if maybe we could get have you read an excerpt of his most famous the, the Morgay Sahar, uh, just maybe a paragraph or anything. I can read something else, yes. which is okay. probably similar. I, I'm going to read something about women, actually, oh, that I long, long time ago, you know, he, he wrote, and you can is then the say, Aizan? yes, Aizan, yes, because they're talking to you, women. You know, and let me get my yes. glasses. As I, as I said before we started the interview, yeah, the, I is, love... I think this is shows that man was feminist. I mean, it's 60 years ago he died. And then, as a young man, how in the world he was feminist? I mean, this is, this is really something. I think it's unbelievable that he was thinking that way. Let me read that, and then she's going to read that. Just this expert, not a whole poem, it's a big poem. جوان بخت و جهان آرای ای زن جمال و زینت دنیای ای زن صدف خانست و صاحب خانه قواست و در وی گوهر یکتا ای زن تو یکتا گوهری در درج خانه وزان بهتر که گوهرزای ای زن تو در عین لطافت زورمندی تو هم گوهر تو هم دریای ای زن چو مغزن در سر و چون هوش در مغز به جا و لایق و شایان ای زن دریقا گر تو با این هوش و ادراک به جهل از این فزونتر پا و ای زن دریقا کس حساب خود و تن را به نیمه تن فلج فرمای ای زن Clearly I can't reproduce that, that repetitive note there the poem is uh, called A Woman, and it is very modern and feminist. 
You are at once both delicate and strong, both the oyster's pearl and its nurturing sea. You are blessed with a keen intelligence and know full well the power of your mind. You are both architect and mason, building happiness in the world. When men are blind to women's strengths, blind to their worth, society is crippled. How sad. For where women are paralyzed, so too is the culture. Very beautiful. And as I had said before, we had started the interview, um, I loved the book and the only thing I didn't like was that I couldn't hear what it sounded like in, in the original language. So it was very nice to really hear that for the first time. I, I, I just, you know, was, as I read, I just thought, what does it sound like? It must be so beautiful, you know, hearing, you know, reading your description of, of, of the layers and all of that. I just, I really felt that I was missing so much just reading the translation. So at least hearing that the pacing and, and the rhyming was very... And the music of poetry. Yes. Really, there is a music in Persian poetry. Okay. That it comes by always, you know, you read it loud. Mm -hmm. And poetry is part of the culture. The mere judge can condemn you by just one verse of poem from any poet, great poet we have in Iran. It is part of the culture, yeah. and everyday language is poetry. When we've talked about the book elsewhere, a lot, of, especially the older Persians in the audience, start talking along with, with Pavane as she's reading the poetry. They know it. They know it by heart. It's in their blood, you know, and learning, memorizing poetry. Is, is really, I don't know whether the young people still do it, Pavane, but the older people just chime in. Oh, the young reading. people do. The young, the young people, people do. do. Oh, yeah, they memorize my father's poetry and read it in the street, men and women. Okay. They're very much, he's far much closer to the Persian now than he ever been before. Now they feel it. Now touch his words. What is freedom? Nobody should can put you in the jail or any kind of a jail. You are free. That was the freedom that really is the theme of this book. From all aspects of life, you are born free. And doesn't matter where and what doesn't matter what. This is a poem that it could be used in Egypt or so Syria, anywhere. You're ready? Naleye Melat Has Soti Bas Mohi Bokhuf Nauk Bangetu Ponare Farmandahan. سختتر زان است بانک سائقه کندر و ید نیمه شب از آسبان هست از آن بسیار هولنگیز در قررش طوفان به بحر بیکران باشد از آشوب طوفان سختتر نعرهای موهش آتش فشان هست از اینها جمله خوفنگیز در ناله یک ملت بی خانمان hmm. It's wonderful. It, the poem in English is uh, the cry of the people. There is a sound more powerful and fearsome than the boom of a cannon or the howl of a warrior in battle more than the crash of lightning in the darkness, the typhoon pounding the shore with killer waves, or even the roar of an erupting volcano. More powerful than all these sounds is the cry of injustice from those without hope, from those who have been oppressed. This is the loudest sound of all.
And this is the poem that you thought of on the march to Selma, correct? One of them. One of them. When you were with all those people and with Martin Luther King Jr. marching. Marching everywhere. In you, and you heard mm -hmm. the voices. And yeah. you my, father was, was, my father is actually right there leading them mm -hmm. to whatever way. He's becoming more and more famous. You know, the first time after 13 years I went to Iran, you know, and they kept me seven hours right. interrogation. And after that, which I wrote in the book, when they shift and more educated people come to look at my past, but, <gasps> you are really the daughter of the, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, pack you up, go in now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's very much, he's the heart of the people. Uh, uh, and, and the soul of the people. Yeah. And his words, just really quick, I mean, we see here the movements in, in the United yeah. States, the Occupy movement. His words, yeah. you know, fit. I, I, I think it, they would do a great service if, if, if Americans here knew his words. They Absolutely. would empower many people here as well. Absolutely. When I tell them that he was feminist, when he was the feminist. Yeah. That and that's is the quality of humanity and integrity of human being. And, and where are you on your, your book tour right now? Where are you going next? Uh, Thursday, the 19th, is going to be in Persian bookstore in Los Angeles at shirkat e uh, And then on the 27th, is going to be in Orange County, one of the public library. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And on 29 is going to be a UCLA. Then I move to San Jose for February. Uh, February 12 is going to be in Barnes and Noble. They give a book signing. Then I talk at the Stanford just about my father, the man and his poetries. Wow. And there's no book signing there, just a lecture in English. Mm -hmm. And then after that, going to Berkeley and talk about the book and about him, about everything else. Again, it's not for the book signing, but it is a lecture. And also poetry reading, which both of us are going to do oh. over there, more than probably two or three. And uh, then after that, uh, 26 is on the Berkeley, Berkeley, and then going back eastward. And how many states have you visited so far? So far, we had several, we had one big, huge book signing in Politics and Prose, which is a very famous bookstore, really, in the United States. Yeah. And that was the biggest one. But we had few, you know, at the home of friends or things like that. Then we came. We went to Vancouver. 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 We just come from Vancouver yeah. a wow. day ago. Yeah. And then the Iranian Canadian had a gathering for us. And then we back to Los Angeles and uh, then tonight, of course. And then we're going to Asher Katiketab on Thursday. Afternoon, I think, is between 5 and 8. is talk and reading and book signing. So you are very, very, very busy. busy. Yes, very busy. Do you, get, do you manage to fit sleep in? <laughs> you know, it, 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 this is something I think probably, again, I inherited from my, my father, no matter how sick I am. When I am uh, standing in front of the people, I energize by them. And, and I think he's... I think his idea of how you can sell democracy through just one-to-one -one talk helped me a lot to, to go and do that. And I hope, as I said, I remain healthy and do it. It's becoming a mission to me. <laughs> yeah. Your father, if he were alive, what kind of advice or what kind of message would he give to people, not just in Iran, not just in the United States, but all over the world who are, who are feeling injustice and who are standing up and maybe for the first time standing up and not understanding necessarily what it is that is causing them to be upset, but they know that they must take to the streets and, and make their voice heard. What do you, 
What do you think your father would say? Well, he would just say what he did himself. I mean, his life is 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 a great. You know, I we just brought it here that what kind of a life he had. He never gave up, never give up. And actually, one woman asked me in one of the book signing. You know, as he said, she said the only thing that. I really impressed me more than anything else. You never gave up. And I said, that's true. Don't give up. My message to all over oppressed people who are under dictatorship, injustices, whether injustice is a government or your husband or your son or your neighbor or whoever, stand up for your right. And doesn't matter. You get killed. Don't be scared. Just stand up and fight and fight. To women, educate yourself and fight. To the black, don't believe anything what they tell you. You are just as good as they are. This is his message. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for thank coming you. in today. Parvani and Joan, it was a pleasure to have you here on Inside Out News. So I, I really hope that this isn't the last time that we meet. And I, I wish you the best of luck with the rest of your book tour. And I hope that this that your book brings your father's poetry to many people who have never had an opportunity to hear his words I or read so. his words. Mm. I hope so. It was we a great privilege, so. Margot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you Thank both. You Thank you very much. Thank you.